that's a fun place to launch in something like the very early vintages, you know, like the very early time that you first started encountering what we'll loosely call e-learning. But if uh, not that we'll do a cr chronology the whole way through, <laughs> but if, uh, if, if you want to take us back to there, I think it sort of adds to your bona fides. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me as well. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was, I, I, uh, I turned thirty, and I must have had some sort of midlife crisis, early, early midlife crisis, I suppose. And uh, I went and taught English uh, to, to kids in South, uh, in. Sorry, give me, give South me one Korea. sec. Yeah. With you. Yep. Yeah. And uh, when I came back from teaching English, I was trying to work out, you know, what to do. And I, I actually was looking at doing uh, a master's in creative arts, but my undergrad was in IT. And uh, I eventually decided to go back and do my master's in interactive multimedia, which combined a lot of the stuff I'd done in uh, computer science, but also I have a background in, in painting and sculpture and dramatic arts. But I think the first time I started getting quite interested in the e-learning part was when I was teaching English in Melbourne after South Korea. And I started, I remember I created this sort of A to Z uh, interactive uh, chart that you could click and engage with as, a, as an early English learner and just learn sort of the alphabet and some you know, key words and, and translating that out of Korean. I was also quite interested in the phonetics of the Korean language as well. And in fact, when I taught kids English in South Korea, I used to, I learned the Korean alphabet on the way over there and I was able to uh, sort of break down English words phonetically, which is cool, but you have to sort of invent a couple of uh, phonics because <laughs> they don't exist in Korean. That was probably the first time I got quite interested in that. And then more and more my lessons, I would prepare and yeah, this is a good sort of 16 years ago, I would prepare some e-learning links and web links and stuff that, that were out there to help people with their ESL exams, for example. And that was quite a popular resource uh, down in Melbourne. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so that was, that was the beginning of the journey. Then when I was doing my master's in interactive multimedia, I was quite interested in the learning journey itself. And so I was talking to the professors about that. And I was like, you know, I might be interested in coming back and doing some teaching. And I did. I, I, I did a stint of teaching in Photoshop at uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, and again, that was you know, highly interactive. And I remember actually one of the subjects I did in my master's, they did a flipped classroom. And I absolutely hated it. I remember I even <laughs> some sort of formal complaint. Like we would have to stay up late watching this hour and a half video of this very monotonous piece of um, screen flow of how to code HTML. And then we'd, you know, turn up a, a week later and there would be no actual lecture, but they would sort of uh, tutor you through it. But uh, by the end of that subject, I was really impressed because uh, I, by far that was my greatest grade in the entire degree. Mm. And I think that that way of teaching actually had a lot to do with it because you could pause and, and go back. And if you did, you know, whereas in a traditional face-to-face -face lecture, you missed something and you didn't take the note, that's it. Uh, and they would often encourage you to, to, okay, pause if you need to, and then just try it, you know, try building a web page or, or whatever it was. So let, let me see if I can like maybe pull something out of there, which is, the goal of the goal of good learning design is is the learning, presumably. But there is certainly a big focus, and I think you would see this in a lot of your work, say course box, and um, and certainly your understanding of, of digital interfaces, UI and UX, is like the enjoyment of the learning. But I think those can sometimes pull in opposite directions. You just said to me that you had this experience and you kind of hated it. And after going through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> you were like, you know what? Awesome grade. And yeah. so the, the kick of good learning came later. So what do, you, what do you make of that since you see, I think more than almost anybody would see of those two things, the enjoyment, the user interface, the overall like pleasure of the experience, but also 
where's the quality of the learning? What's the trade-off there? <clears throat> yeah, there's definitely a trade-off. And, and I've seen this because after I finished the master's, I went in, into instructional design and for adult learning. And we would often have to convince some of our uh, bigger clients that it's okay to have maybe a cartoon-esque sort of quality and maybe some more playful language within the e-learning rather than it just being so uh, hierarchical and technical. Uh, and, um, and why is that? It's because, it, you know, you want a bit of play. Uh, and that's how we learn best is if something is playful and, and you, you know, people talk about failing, but the idea that uh, you don't always have to get everything perfectly right all the time, but you've got a bit of exploration there. But it's the same sort of thing. You don't want to just watch a clinical page turning e-learning and then tick the boxes and do the quiz. Why, why not make it a bit more fun and have some playful scenarios in there as well? So there's always that dichotomy of or that to and fro between, you know, ticking the boxes and making something technically accurate, but also having, having room to breathe and make it enjoyable and not too painful. And that's certainly something uh, I worked at open colleges for a while designing two-year vocational training programs and one of the issues we were asked to look at is look at the drop-off why do people you know stop after several months and how can we keep them in there and it's like well you've got to keep them engaged and if it's just you know download the stuff upload your assignments and do it in your own time and good luck uh, the more support you can provide the better and they did you know they had certain support officers but I think you can do that asynchronously as well. So that's why I invented this concept of a checkpoint where you can constantly have at least asynchronous engagement with your trainers. Mm. Uh, and so I'm just talking about the socialization of the learning experience because we've seen, you know, the, with the advent of social media, it becomes quite addictive and exciting. Well, why don't you apply that to learning? And again, you've got that playfulness, you've got your peers in there, you've got a socialization aspect, uh, and that can be another way to to remove the monotony of the e-learning experience. So when you, um, you know, uh, course box is quite interesting. You were, you, you showed me some of this in the past and you can set up sort of a, the basic architecture of a good, of a good course, which is that lessons will build to modules, which build to kind of like the overall, um, say learning objectives of a course and so on. If you saw somebody new at the game coming in and doing that, Travis, and there's no, there's no humor, which isn't an essential, if you can, you can have a good course with no jokes, right? right. Um, uh, do you see that as like problematic? Do you, when you look at a course and you think, look, substantively everything's here, but I just don't know that it's warm, fuzzy, funny, mm -hmm. engaging and so forth. Would you make that as a point of critique or would you say, look, you know, your job is to, is just to teach the learner. This doesn't have to be, the no ornamentation has to be added to this. Where, where do you generally fall? Uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of, uh, say, HR out there that just needs compliance training done as rapidly as possible and they can tick the box and, you know, they're compliant. <laughs> but if there's a little bit of room in there, I've always said as from an instructional point of view, to make it actually engaging, you're going to have a better learning output. And, you know, if it's not just about compliance, but about people actually being compliant long term and actually learning it, you know, on a deeper level, that's where you want things to be a bit more interactive, engaging, you know, advanced scenario building, branch scenarios, ideally some sort of, you know, playfulness uh, where you can experiment. I've, one of the best courses I did, I think, was in conjunction at, with Adelaide University and a professor there who ended up winning an award for the amazing work she does. It's called Think, Create, Code, and it's on the EDX platform. Hmm. I was doing the project management and some of the instructional design, and then we had the, the professors putting in all the real content and expertise. But that's a great example of, of being very playful, even though it's very heavy material, like you're, you're teaching basic principles of how to code and code well. Uh, but they always had these, you know, canvases where you could explore and play around with it. Uh, and I think another good example is a cloud guru out of Melbourne who have been able to 
uh, scale their cloud training business exponentially. It's, it's ridiculous how fast they grew. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, but um, deeply inherent in their platform is that ability to play and try stuff. I don't mean play as in a playground. I mean, actually ex try what you're learning during the e-learning. Yeah. So I think that's crucial. Uh, but I think the, the more empirical question there is around uh, instructional design principles. You know, as a sort of senior instructional designer, I've gone through the ropes over years and developed a series of se sequential steps to chunk learning and work backwards from learning objectives and assessment criteria. But not everybody thinks like that, right? I certainly didn't when I went into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's what we're trying to automate with Coursebox. You know, you, it's all well and good to say, go to ChatGPT and try to get it to write you a course structure. But unless you're sort of saying, oh, I need you to start from the assessment criteria. Here's some feed in content. Uh, you need to chunk it in this particular methodology. These are the sorts of learners we're talking to. It's not five-year-olds, it's 30-year-olds, and they already have a PhD. If you're not giving it those sorts of inputs, it's like rubbish in, rubbish out. You're not necessarily going to get what you're hoping for. Uh, and we're trying to take a lot of that into the back end so you don't have to think about it. We'll do that, those objectives for you. We'll, we've got a very clever algorithm there. Uh, and I think that's one of the hardest things to do when you're, you know, if you haven't got 10 years experience designing courses, and even if you do, it's still quite hard to take all that existing knowledge and content and you, what you're trying to do and create a high level design. But once you can get that high level design, it's a bit like designing the chapters of your book. You can then, you know, it's much more micro level actually writing the content and writing the assessments at that point. And we do that for you as well. <laughs> but that's another story. Yes, it, yeah, it's it turned fun. out in, in, in our journey as, a, you know, a, a group of craftsmen trying to work this out on our side. It's turned out that one of the trickiest puzzles of them all is how big is a course? Mm -hmm. I never would have guessed that. I would have thought that's the easy one. But when you go to a subject matter expert inside a business, and you, first of all, sometimes you have to convince them that they have a course inside of them. You're like, you are a 35 year experience government relations expert. Like, trust me, mm -hmm. you don't know how many courses you've got inside you. Yeah. But the thing that, that uh, really surprises them and still has some kind of sense of wonder for me is how big is a course? Because usually when you plumb the depths, like you said, that chapter structure, yeah. it's almost fractal. Like if you just chose one of those chapters, you could make that the book title and it needs chapters yeah. and down you go. Um, we got we to gotta spend some time on this business of how AI plugs in and chat GPT. So um, because, because it's a great, great structuring brain, mm. I mean, uh, easily better than our brains for structure. Can you just can you just take it back a step, Travis, and assume that folks have only ever heard of ChatGPT and not like like you know a few like a billion people around the world mucked around with it yet, and just ex explain how that works on something like Coursebox? Yeah, well, ChatGPT is uh, you know an artificial intelligence a platform that you can log on to and use for free or upgrade to the, the fourth version, which is even more powerful and cool. And uh, what is it? It's been trained on basically all knowledge. Uh, and it's probably, uh, in fact, certainly smarter than any human on earth. <laughs> this is the argument. So it knows pretty much everything you can imagine up to uh, 2021, which is what it was trained up to, which is a bit of a limitation to be aware of or 3.5. Uh, there's also some other limitations. There's a thing called hallucinations. So occasionally it just tells you stuff that's not true. And uh, if you don't curate that, that's a problem. Um, one of the things you know I tried with it um, is uh, asking it to use Harvard re referencing all the time. I'm like, and give me at least seven resources, blah, blah, blah. And it did it. It was beautiful. It was like you know an essay from a master's degree. Uh, and then when I checked all the references, all of them were just made up. Even the links were just made up. You click them, they don't exist. Spooky. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's improving. And there's there's other plugins out there. Like with Chrome, you, you can plug in and it will search the web and use real life data. I've, I've also tried using the Bing version of AI search, which I, I wasn't as impressed with. 
Uh, but again, they're trying to do stuff there and then Bard's coming out as well with Google. So that's, that's what ChatGPT is. You can interact with it. But what's really cool, what, what does the chat mean? So if you have a, it's a conversation. So you, you'll start saying, can you, let's say, write me a course structure on how to be a mechanic. Uh, it'll, it'll write it and then you'll say, oh, hang on, I meant in, in Australian slang, you know, and oh, was like, oh sorry about that, you know, um, codger, and, you know, and it will, mate, and then it will write it all in Australian slang. Uh, or no, 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 I actually want you to write it as a poem um, in a kind of Shakespearean way. And then it will, it will start writing out stanzas. So it's, it's incredibly interesting to work uh, creatively in, in that chat way. And it remembers your whole history of that chat uh, with its AI. Um, but the next level of that is using the API. Uh, I'm not going to go into what an API is, but basically you can integrate ChatGPT with another platform. And uh, in this case, what we've done is we've taken uh, a course building platform, course box, we've used that API connection and a very complex algorithm to just uh, ping ChatGPT, a whole bunch of requests based on whatever you're asking for. You know, I want a course on this. And then it's, it's able to structure it, write a course title, write five objectives or seven if, if that's your input, a description, break down sections, write quiz questions, write quiz answers. You know, it's quite endless what, what it can do. And if you, if you look into it, uh, I understand it's, it's passed like bar exams and medical exams. Mm. Uh, it's incredibly knowledgeable and powerful. So I, I think one of, the, one of the real tricks that you just alluded to, and someone with your experience knows this by, by muscle memory, but somebody new to it may go on to chat PT, start mucking around and go like, I don't know what this guy Travis is on about because I wrote, please give me you know, a course structure for light duty mechanics you know, and, and how to fix um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, farm machinery. And it came up with a bunch of nonsense, right? It, it doesn't have, have expertise, but the clue that you gave was that you have to, you have to set it the right prompts. And so mm -hmm. maybe just like a little, take, give us like a, a page off your notepad in terms of the kinds of prompts that yep. get AI to stop misbehaving and to start <laughs> behaving. When it, when it comes to this, like how do you get it to set educational structures? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I set my myself a challenge and I looked up sort of the tom, top 10 categories in HR training and then the next sort of 10 course types within that. So I guess that's 100 different things. And I went and worked with ChatGPT actually to generate paragraph long input prompts for each of those course types for HR departments. And I wrote this massive document uh, just with course prompts because it is a bit of an art to get them right. Uh, and it was course prompts, about a paragraph long, that would actually give me a course structure that was useful. <laughs> uh, and then I was able to make a more generic sort of course prompt. And it ended up being a bit like this. It was like, uh, design me a course that is X hours long, let's say five hours long, mm. uh, four, and then you describe your learner. So let's say, um, university graduates who have already studied electrical engineering, you know, full stop. I want this course to be written all in French, right? Or let's say in, uh, in American English, full stop. And it, it can do this, it can write in any language. Uh, and I don't think many people realize that you can get it to write it all in Japanese, you know? Uh, so that's pretty cool. And then the next part of the paragraph was like, uh, I would like it to have five sections or, or let's say, larger lessons within each of those lessons there should be about five pages at the end of each lesson uh, I expect an automated multiple choice quiz with three questions the question should have about four to five multiple choice answers one of them has to be right the other four have to be clearly wrong and by the way this is something it doesn't do very well it often will write answers they're all pretty much right um, so that's something to watch out for um, I would like you to recommend some uh, further resource packs and uh, also write a scenario uh, to highlight each of those five lessons. And that's about it, right? That's, that's basically your packed up thing. So if, 
if you want to try that, give it a go and you, you have varying results, but that's a pretty good sort of structure to get uh, at least a reasonable high level design out of it. And then once you, once it pumps it out and it does it pretty quickly, you can give it feedback and say, no, I said French. <laughs> you wrote it in Indonesian. No, it'll, it'll, it'll default to English. Uh, yeah, but um, I think that's pretty mind blowing. And I was actually looking into it the other day. There's about 7,000 languages globally. And, uh, you know, we know the popular ones, but there's so many uh, that it, it's been, you know, uh, trained on so much data out there, including mm. all languages. Uh, but I did try a very obscure language and it wasn't able to do it. And that's the, uh, the South Australian Aboriginal or Indigenous language called Ghana. Doesn't know that one. And probably because there's almost no written example of that. Right. So it just, it just hasn't been trained on enough uh, material. Yeah, but it's written, I've done a course in, you know, it's written in Japanese, in Russian. Uh, yeah. So, so what I find really fascinating about that is that, uh, say, if we just took course design back um, 80 years ago, um, some of the prompts that you're putting forward are the same prompts that good human instructional designers have to sit there and think about. Like you talked about that prompt, uh, people with this kind of prerequisite uh, learning and knowledge, they already have some core vocabulary in, you know, coding or, you know, the, the, they already have the equivalent of a nurse's degree. Yeah. It's quite fascinating that, that that which human IDs would really have to, instructional designers would really have to take into consideration is also important for the robot. Yeah, because if you're designing, um, the same sort of course that I described, but for an eight-year-old, it's going to be very different. And it's the same thing. Like I got it to write a poem in stanzas with Shakespeare, blah, blah, blah. But I said, can you write one that's like for a five-year-old? And the language was tiny and simple and very small words. And it adapted as well as it could. I mean, it did talk about starry, starry, little star <laughs> something. And, you know, it was and that's, that's one of the risks as well, right? Uh, and it's being debated in the EU uh, around plagiarism. And in that Shakespearean thing, it did really well for about half the page down. The next half, it literally just copy and pasted from Shakespeare. And I was, it's the only time I've seen it happen, but it's a risk to watch out for. And that's another problem with, you know, if it's not doing proper Harvard referencing, that's real. Uh, and I think more and more, you know, it, it just today I was reading in the news that the EU is threatening to require all uh, the sources to be revealed for what what was uh, used to train chat GPT so that they can start looking at plagiarism cases and the, the founder of OpenAI said well we'll just have to pull out of the EU because that's crazy <laughs> and it yeah. is a big problem especially with images now you know and yeah there's um I think that as opposed to just the legal issues of, of intellectual property and, and privacy and, and um, patents and things. Um, there's, another, there's another matter there, which is that when I look at the way that organizations want their instructional design to be, I think about it as something like an asymptotic curve, right? So like way up here would be all the most popular topics. And to be honest, I don't think they need or want anything different than the next organization up the street, the next one, the next one on something like, how should we give and receive feedback among, among colleagues, mm -hmm. right? They don't need to have the specific, like, you know, oh, this, this is the, this is the Australian, you know, or this, this is like the Victoria bank of Australia version. And it has to be totally customized. It's like, a, sorry for that topic. It can be an, it, it can be pretty standard. In fact, it should just be the world-class um, best version. Mm. Way down here on this kind of like long tail, there's some, and so this is the tall head over here that I'm talking mm. about because every organization in the world might want it. So, you know, the axis is how many organizations could use it. <clears throat> Way over here is like their proprietary software. It's like, there's only one organization on the planet that's gonna, that's gonna need that. But uh, what we wouldn't want to see is that as the as machines are developed to really accelerate instructional design, that we just have an unnecessary proliferation of courses. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Am I, I mean, what do you think? Is that, am I right there? Am I wrong? Give me, uh, give me your perspective. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting idea. Uh, hmm, how do you answer that? Well, I mean, we used to think, oh, you know, I've, I've got 20 photos in my camera. Should I take another photo? Uh, I remember thinking that when I was in France when I was 20, because uh, you, you, you equate the cost and then you've got, to, you've got nothing left. So if probably a week it's going to go in, you've got to go and buy a new piece of film. And then, you know, slowly, slowly we had the digital cameras and then uh, we're like, oh, should we have auto upload of our images from our camera? Probably not. You know, that's great. You know, so, you know, and the world is so flooded with bits of images now. It's just unbelievable, isn't it? Um, so I guess it is a risk. And then how are you going to filter and find the courses you need, especially those more generic ones? Um, or is it going to start moving into a more, uh, and I think the Khan Academy is looking at this, a more tu uh, AI tutorial basis uh, as needed learning. And it, you just literally get it to teach you the things you need and, and it will maybe structure things over time. And, and perhaps that's going to be the, the future of where things goes, um, especially once you get too many courses. Uh, I suppose um, Go One has done quite well with building out those more initially generic courses or getting pe other people to build them and upload them. And I saw they did a massive raise today, I think 100 million, and they, they bought another uh, wow. company. Uh, it's big, uh, yeah, big news. Uh, but um, yeah. I don't know about oh, no Travis I, I think that's a I think that's a probably. it's a tremendous analog actually I hadn't <clears throat> thought about it that way once we could take images and you'd be like well that one that one had funny lighting and that one wasn't framed correctly and um you know that that one I had a bit of you know I was having a sneeze when I when I took it and each one of these doesn't represent the the money cost and time cost and logistics cost of going to print film um you're right our behaviors changed the core artistry of photos hasn't changed though so if you see photos from the 1970s the great ones that were just beautifully constructed really well timed nicely framed <clears throat> these are great photos and that doesn't change right they could have been taken with the digital camera or some anything else the eye of the artist is actually the magic there. And I think there's something in that too, which is um, even 10 years ago, the speed of construction of a good instructional designer just meant that nobody was, nobody was going to see what was inside her mind until, mm. you know, 30 hours of 30 hours of labor had gone to work. And now we can see what's inside her mind, mm -hmm. you know, 45 minutes later. Yeah. At least in draft. Yeah. Or at least on a high level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I think um, that conundrum of the graph you were illustrating is an interesting one between, you know, what is a useful course that can be developed in conjunction rapidly with, with AI? And what is something that's going to probably be pretty useless, especially if it's a very succinct part of Australian law or something. This came up with a client the other day. They're like, oh, it's always American law and it's always, you know, we have to rewrite everything anyway. Um, or, or like you were talking about a software simulation that's, that's very specific. Uh, and then, you know, can you get the AI to learn your software first? Well, maybe. Um, I haven't come across anything like that yet. Um, yeah, but you know, we've been talking about content-based uh, AI. We should probably talk at some point about the the multimedia aspect because not everybody wants a course that's just text anyway. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Starry Starry AI is amazing for image creation, for example. And you can drill right down to make things photorealistic, and, and AI just creates these images on demand rather than having to go to stock photos and, and buy them. So I'm quite interested in that aspect as well. Well, I can tell you, uh, so from, from the field in Singapore and Canada, right, these are the organizations we work with. They're very different, by the way. Uh, so here, much more classic business, classic professional services. In Canada, much more government. So massive organizations, completely government funded, 
um, slow on the innovation side, but you know, huge scale. Here, kind of, they move at the, the speed of professional services business. Well, you can't you can't take folks like that and and put them through pen and paper style testing mm. for more than maybe ten percent of the total flow of a of a course. Mm -hmm. And even something that's online, you've got to be really attentive to how densely you pack the material and teach it. So you were talking images. I first go to video, mm -hmm. um, especially for something like, you know, we teach, we, we teach or help our clients teach their own people a lot on client engagement. Mm -hmm. Well, like nobody wants to read nine paragraphs uh, describing a scenario for client engagement when uh, 35 seconds of video sets it perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, how else would you describe the ambiance and structure of a catch up coffee mm. with a client and why you speak one way and not another? Like mm. prose is not the answer for, for such a learning tool and video is still images also aren't. So I'm with you like the, the um, and this is, this is where it's a little bit entertainment but we're not trying to tell jokes. And, and we're not trying to just like keep endorphins firing or something. Um, we're trying to do really effective learning. So what do you see as the, what do you see as the future convergence of AI video, AI image, AI text, which we've been talking about uh, and where they, where they're going to contribute to learning? Uh. Well, yeah, firstly, I'll mention I've been playing around with some AI that builds animations called Steve AI. And I was really impressed. And I just made a play, a, a, a fun sort of video, actually, for the family. <laughs> but, you know, you can, you can do amazing stuff with Steve AI for quick animations that illustrate learning scenarios. You know, let's say work health and safety, how to, how to lift something or, or whatever. That's a really good one to play around with. And it lets you customize characters. It will recommend characters based on your scripting. Uh, and it's got, you know, a huge raft of templates. Uh, you can make it a child, an adult, uh, and it can walk from left to right. We can have an airport behind uh, as we did uh, when I was trying it out. And then it also does the voiceover for you. So it does these animations with voiceover rapidly. Uh, and I think it was Steve AI that you can train I'd have to double check if it was Steve AI where you can train uh, your own voice. Right. Uh, but I found it very robotic, uh, whatever the service was I was using. But with Steve AI, if you just use out of the box uh, voiceover, it does a pretty good job uh, in a few different accents and male or female. Uh, the other one is I mentioned Starry AI. So I looked at a whole bunch of different image uh, AI generators like Dal E, which is the open AI one. Uh, Canva has recently started incorporating some magic tools and some AI tools and so on. <laughs> and uh, so where's the convergence? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, even, even if you are generating text automatically, to have automatically recommended images and graphics and animations that can go alongside that and, and create immediately more engaging things. And also not just animations but also scenario uh yeah scenarios and uh, interactives you know even if it's just click and reveals or or scrolls or whatever it is uh so i think it has to converge and you see that with scorm compliant say articulate storyline courses that are you know it's always one of the requirements either have some some video content some interactive content uh or uh certainly image driven but it can certainly, I think you can save money and time if you can generate images on the fly. Mm -hmm. So, so imagine, um, imagine how many instructional designers there are out there right now. I don't, I don't know what that number is. Like, I don't know if it's 10,000 or 5,000 or 150,000, but there's a bunch of folks whose job it is right now. Their job title is instructional designer. They're doing the craft that you were doing 18 years ago, right? Um, and, and saying, well, how, how would a learner best pick up this information? And it's my job to bring it to life. A lot of them are in-house at, you know, at corporations. 
this might be some of the folks who I guess you work with, right? Where they're saying, look, I'm I'm in house at, you know, Acme, Australia, South Australia, um, but you know, I I need a bunch of tools and support in order to pull off my learning objectives. Do you think these folks are out of a job? Do you think the thing that the thing that they do day to day is just going to change? Do you think there'll be one tenth as many of them? What's your what's your sense about that role? Uh, yeah, I think there's a risk. I saw a joke on an instructional design forum a couple of days ago, actually, and it said, uh, "Until we can get clients to define their requirements accurately, we've got nothing to worry about." <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, right. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> uh, I certainly think if you're not using AI in a hybrid format as an instructional designer, you're in real trouble because <laughs> yeah. you're still going to be doing what you're doing 10 years ago at a certain speed, which yeah. could probably be sped up uh, and you can get more output. I actually talked about ChatGPT to a client recently who's the, the CEO. And he was so excited and I did the demo. And I'm like, you can, you can rapidly build courses, blah, blah, blah. And one of the instructional designers called me up an hour later and said, what the hell did you say to the CEO? He's expecting like 10 times the output now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, you got to run your talking points by these guys before you get, on, you get online with the big guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of fear out there and, and very right so about our robots going to take our jobs um, and and what impact will AI have on jobs and it will be big I don't think there's any way around it uh, if you talk about you know what you can do as a client with marketing using um, Jarvis uh, yourself rather than having to go and find a marketing consulting firm to, to do stuff for you yeah you know, that's that's taking work away, isn't it? Uh, and it's it's giving that money and and to a different company, which is Jarvis. And I think more and more that's a problem. Uh, I've often thought, well, you know, if jobs are taken away here, there'll be a another sort of skill set that you need to learn and evolve with, just like when the calculator took away the jobs of everybody that had good memories from that. So again, that's <laughs> not really true, but that was one of the worries, right? Sure. And I think it's just another tool we have to work with, but I, I do think it will take away certain jobs for sure. You know, we see that in uh, like Coles or um, supermarkets, don't we? When you can just self check out, there's definitely less people working the checkout. Yeah. Right. So a lot of those lower level st jobs that um, will be the first to go uh, by robots and AI. So, so I've been kind of mapping this this business with with marketing, right? Because obviously that was one of the early um, surges of enthusiasm around um, uh, OpenAI. What was look, this thing can write some great copy. I mean, it can it can rip me off a blog post. I've just published ten blog posts today. You know, it's like okay, great. But to me, the the thing that that is not accounted for in that model and that little sugar rush of enthusiasm is Who's going to read that, right? And especially if it broadly takes hold. And I think we got to answer that in the learning world too, is like, who's actually going to take these courses? So, okay. And touches on my question about prol needless proliferation of courses, mm -hmm. right? It's actually directed to learners. Like what this is in aid of is serving hungry learners. So let's just first admit there's a massive gap still there's not like it's not like there's too many courses in the world today right mm -hmm. there's way 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 too few uh, and learn and other kinds of learning opportunities mm -hmm. but the world doesn't need just way 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 more marketing copy and it actually doesn't just need any old way 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 more courses either mm -hmm. right it needs whatever whatever people are willing to and it doesn't need more blog posts right so just saying we can make a new mountain of these assets mm. doesn't square with the rest of the model, which is there, where's the demand? We know we can ramp up supply. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, like things are evolving though. So that's that's a point. Like the courses we need in 10 years are very different to the courses we need today. 
And I've seen that trend already with the, the, the types of courses that are being drafted on course box, even if it's just rapidly quick drafts, it's often got the, the term AI in it. AI right. for marketing, AI for courses, AI for this. And uh, that wasn't really much of a thing, you know, until very recently. So, so adaptive learning is the thing that comes to mind. And it comes back to maybe what Khan Academy is talking about with that um, child and uh, adult tutor-based AI. And it's uh, not just a simple tutor, like it's a tutor that seems to know everything and knows how to teach well, you know, that's the yeah. concept of that. And that's adaptive learning. So, and that, that's the other thing we have to think about with AI, you know, text, image, video aside, uh, algorithm-based AI. Uh, you know, YouTube apparently is the biggest user of algorithm-based AI that exists. And uh, it's, it's called a recommendation engine, right? And same with uh, Netflix got a very powerful one too. And uh, so probably, I, you know, the use of AI that we don't even see and notice uh, that recommends things, including learning pathways. And I think if, if organizations look at building out learning libraries, huge learning libraries that can be a, more adaptive, or if you can get some sort of, you know, AI tutor in there as well. And we're looking at uh, AI assessment, which is pretty cool. Like, you, you know, if so yeah. we're going to embed this in course box as well, when you uh, upload an essay or, or write an answer immediately, you can get, um, a reasonable response with good feedback. Obviously, that should be created, curated by a, a real human, especially for a long time. Uh, but I think that sort of thing, on-demand, immediate, adaptive learning is, is where things are going to go. I have a, I have a perspective on, on the application of uh, GPT in K-12 education, which isn't that popular perspective. Um, They've been using robots to grade exams forever. I remember, I don't know if you know this business Scantron, but Scantron would basic, was basically just like a fairly primitive reading eye that would look at multiple choice questions. You get this narrow sheet of paper, you need right. to print a paper, you'd pencil it in. And if you like penciled it in wrong and erased it, and you like smudge the eraser mark, it would mark you wrong. But anyway, they, they gave you these warnings. You had to be really precise with your pencil. And it had to be HB pencil, you know, not like 2H or whatever. Anyway, you do that and they feed it into like it, it looked like it was built in Russia in the 70s, right? It's like a big box, but they just feed those babies in there. And they're like, yay, you know, the teacher doesn't have to sit there and flip page by page on everybody's exam and see if it was A, B or C. And, you know, they get tired, get something wrong. Great. Scantron. That's easily 30 years old, right? Mm. When I wrote the GRE exam, they give you a, a notice in there and that, that you could tell by the way they wrote it that they expected it to be a surprise. One of the graders of your essay is going to be a computer and one of them is going to be a human. That's just so that you know, I'm pretty sure at some point it was just all, all um, computers, not humans. But that would have been like 20 years ago. Mm. or so and uh and so on and so on so to me i actually have no problem at all with the idea that students want to use a robot to submit a paper when a robot's going to grade it yeah because because i sort of and i what i'd love to see on the assessment side is those who have been kind of happily with no sense of compunction or problem using robots step up and evolve the human side of of assessment to match what has been really the asymmetric human requirement for production, right? So students mm -hmm. have had to like sit there and like, well, I'm writing like a pencil, but like type out and think through these essays that mm -hmm. another human never reads. It's like, oh, I'll give that to a robot to read. Yeah. Um, and now I think like, no, let a robot write it, let a robot read it. And now let's get the humans back in touch for different a different configuration of um, assessment, something different. Yeah. Yeah, I'll actually illustrate this with an Australian client of, of mine, who, who, by the way, we should introduce you to based out of Sydney, super business, um, doing expert networks. But they have a compliance um, uh, test, right? Yeah. So what we've done is a, we, we've just thrown chat GPT, the fundamentals of like, write me a 50 question open book compliance test based on this 
very dry reading. It's a compliance manual, all right? Okay. But the complement to it is you have to pass a few verbal conversations with a senior team member who are basically just going to role play somebody confused about the compliance documents. You have to be in a position to guide them through no notes, no anything. Mm. So to me, I'm, I'm not trying to like pat ourselves on the back. That might not be like an A++ version, but it's the complement of, you know, let's, let's use the AI where it's needed and, mm. and then let's use the humans where they're best. Yeah. Well, that's another good point, isn't it? It's, it's not necessarily that you're going to be able to replace your instructional designer with AI anytime soon, I don't think. Uh, because it, you know, like you're saying, it's well. I'm actually, I've actually got a plethora of AI I can use, and at my hands, and I'm going to work in a hybrid way to to get the the best, most you know, rapid outcome here. Uh, and I'm going to use Starry AI and Steve AI and a bit of ChatGPT, and you know, you, you sort of pluck from the menu, and and uh, and that's how you can add value, rather than just saying we don't, we don't need instructional designers. But yeah, that's just harking back to that old question. But I, can I just raise one? thought no this is no okay <laughs> damn it <laughs> let me there's this big question at the moment with chat gpt uh about abuse for us by a students writing their assessments right and a lot of universities in australia have banned chat gpt for that reason except in south australia where they've said you can use it you just have to tell us that you used it <laughs> so it's kind of the honesty system which is maybe a better approach because it's like throwing out the calculator you know we're going to let you use it but it's another tool and i think that's that's a good way to do it but uh, same sort of thing you know if we're going to automate with a robot what a student's submitting are we going to have to like flag when they've actually used a robot to write their assessment <laughs> um yeah so that was an interesting yeah, this, this, so I, this is what I was thinking the first time I was hearing about the, uh, you know, the use of, use of open AI for, for marketing, too. It's like, well, pretty soon people are just going to get robots to read the marketing to tell them what the hell to buy and, you know, what to really click into. Yeah. So it's going to be robots writing marketing for robots to see, you know, mm -hmm. and like the, the, the two, two humans in this interaction are going <laughs> to gonna get further and further apart. Yeah, well, that's it. And that's one of the worries, I think, for businesses that, you know, you've got all your your uh, seo out there and all that for search but what about when search is redundant when everybody's just relying on on siri or their amazon device and asking it and it's the recommendation engine of uh, what's the amazon device called alexa alexa hey alexa um which kettle should i buy this one shall i ship it to you now you know it's like oh all of my SEO is gone because I was such a good kettle company, but you know, now Alexa has the choice. And I think that's one of the, the things marketers have to watch out for soon or any business has to watch out so, for. So let me just, let list. me just jump on that hay wagon a second um, okay. and put to you a dynamic that I see in professional services firms. When I started our work, one of the things I assumed is that if you go to learners and you ask them what they would like to learn, you're going to get good, rich data. And it's true, but it's actually only true for a certain class. Not now that I've had, you know, many, many chances to ask this question. Yeah. I don't trust the answers at the junior level. So let's say, let's say eight years of experience or less. They're not a good, reliable source for what they should learn. Yeah. Um, cause they'll guess any, all kinds of things like their eyes are bigger than their stomach. They'd be like, I need to learn massive size deal, hardball negotiation tactics. Yeah. Like, man, you're, you're still like a junior associate. Like, trust me, you don't need, that's not where the gap is today for you, yeah. but, but that will happen. And then the other thing is that they'll kind of get stumped and be like, I don't know. And then I might pick something they already know. Like I need to learn document editing skills like no you actually don't like you're super at document editing you're like five stars on that right now yeah so they're not a super reliable source whereas the the more senior you go they get very sharp and precise eyes not only for their juniors because they used to be in those roles but they get better and better self-assessment eyes too so when you go to um to the managing partners of a law firm and you say, well, what, what is it that you really need to learn if you had the time and the resources? They will be like, 
incredibly incisive. Like, yeah. I, I really need to learn techniques for organizing my personal uh, context data. Like, okay, well, that's not random. That's not broad. That's quite precise. Or they may say something like, um, you know, I, I need to learn the way in which I deliver and delegate complex mm -hmm. tasks, who, which will then be delegated on further. Like, holy cow, this stuff's precise and mm -hmm. and uh, and kind of prescient. So that is to me something like the what I've seen in like the referral engine. So we were talking about Alexa and uh, Netflix's tool, and you know Spotify has one too. This mm. is machines doing the best they can to say, you just finished that. You might like this next. Yeah. When it comes to what people learn in the workplace, that's the only pattern that I've really seen. What, what have you seen? What do you make of all that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just thinking about in the workplace. Gosh. I think that's right, that you, you can't necessarily ask the learner what they need to learn. But what's nice about these algorithms, the more you work with them, they'll know you better than you know yourself. And that's what Facebook says. You, you like three posts. We know you better than your mother does or, or something like that. You know, a bit of a brag probably, but they do know a crap load of data about you very rapidly. Uh, and it might be the same thing. You've done three courses and if they're well designed enough and the assessments are in depth enough and the interactives give them enough hot data and whatnot, and then they know your age, your demographic, um, maybe what other people are struggling with, if, especially if it's a very large organization with mass data, uh, or if you're using a platform with, with you know, tens of millions of, of learners doing different things and, and it, can, it can judge like Spotify can judge. That's when it might know you what you need better than you do. Mm. Uh, or even if you say, and I think it's the same sort of thing. And that's why we have structured university degrees, isn't it? Because if you if you go into a degree at 16 and say, I just want to be able to build a SaaS product um, in JavaScript or, or something. Well, if, if you go through, let's say a two year or three year degree, it will slowly step you through the stages of, of getting to a, a proficient level in backend technologies. And yeah. that might be the right choice anyway, for whatever the application is. Yeah. On the other hand, there's an argument to saying, especially in coding, well, just try and jump in and get going with it to a degree. And, and some people can and get it early. Uh, but that's not true with everything. And I, I certainly wouldn't want a surgeon to just jump in at 16 and start cutting open heads. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I really yeah. want them to go through, let's say, 12 years of rigorous training. <laughs> yeah, you want that careful training. <laughs> It's it's a super interesting insight, right? That a university is is a very primitive recommendation engine. Uh, I say primitive, which which sounds like pejorative, but what I mean is it's not inventing these things in a millisecond. Yeah. That's the only sense in which I mean primitive. In fact, it's very deep and thoughtful. It's a cultural heritage. Once you finish a one thousand level course, which is the general survey <laughs> of philosophy then you get the chance to dip into logic 2000 mm -hmm. then you get the chance to you know study modal logics or whatever and so on and so on through yeah. this yeah through sort of a natural recommended series yeah. yeah it's the same sort of thing i suppose if you're you're 22 and you, you and the ai understands a certain amount and you say i really want to uh learn rocket science <laughs> It's not going to just jump you straight into an advanced course in rocket science. That would be a, a mistake. Yeah. yeah. It's going to have to say, okay, I've created a four year program for you. Here's step yeah. one. You know? Yeah. So that's where prerequisite pathways are really important as well. We're just about uh, at, at an hour. I knew that would happen. I knew, I knew it would vanish. It would evaporate uh, like, an interesting time. Like, like water in the Australian sun. Although not right now, is it? It's not exactly the sunny days for you guys at the moment. But a lot of water. It's not drying. Yeah, up. yeah. If only there was water. Um, Sun. Um, but uh, I'm really glad we did it because I'm really interested in in your particular um, viewpoint and sort of lens on this world, which is very dear to us and and a lot of the folks we work for. Um, 
the the conventional thing to do at this time is to ask where people can find you but i actually think you you've you've done all the work to be quite quite findable so i think maybe a better thing um travis is like is to maybe hear you say what kinds of folks you're most enthusiastic enthusiastic to work with who are the kinds of people where for for you the engagements are most valuable and most interesting at the moment yeah i think it depends on on the product and what we're talking about so with course box you know it's designed for anyone that wants to rapidly produce e-learning and i'm i'm fascinated by you know basically every country on earth has has signed up for our free plans already it's fascinating uh all sorts of different languages and uh, all sorts of different topics from you know how to play bridge better to uh you know ai for marketing tools and, and much more advanced stuff uh, so i find that fascinating uh, with with open shoot you know that's that was designed as a kind of facebook for education and that's still a great community platform and uh, the the clients we've got to work with are fantastic from from the University of Adelaide uh, training doctors 24-7 to uh, Wine Australia uh, training in the ag sector, you know, how to scale your winery faster. But then there's all the options for the networking and connectedness uh, and uh, through the socialization and democratization of, of learning on those platforms. And it's all mobile centric. So, you know, just like your Facebook app, that's where you can engage. And it's not just about learning, it's about group discussions peer to peer mm. uh, and I find that fascinating uh, uh, and certainly with web design cafe with bes bes you know building bespoke e-learning uh, we're working with airports universities and uh, and uh, you know probably our biggest client is in the dental uh, training space again for, for b2b growth so fantastic working with such a raft of, of different exciting clients and, and I really appreciate your time and, and thanks for having me here today. You bet. We're going to we're going to throw in a whole bunch of links. Star AI, Steve AI, Dal E, Cloud Guru. Anything we're missing there? Oh, there's there's tons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, you're, you're like Kevin. What that, what that what that there is, is a dumb question. Yeah, yeah course, we'll say for sure. <laughs> well, we're we're gonna we're gonna put in all, all all your links too. So anyway, I don't wanna I don't wanna flood people, but I think uh, a lot of folks are just gonna figure out their their own personal path through this by having a bit of a a try, right? By jumping into open to opening course box and doing one two courses and figuring out where they where they sit and how that works for them. Cool. Um, so we'll just we'll lo we'll load them up with that that kind of wayfinding, so they can get their way to you or some of these other things we touched on. And also, if, and if you do jump in, let's say the course box, it's, you know it's free to, to use uh, on the on the on the Boxer plan. And we'd love to hear your feedback, or if 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 you think there's another feature that we should we should put in there, please let us know. Okay, good. Cool. Please, we did it, Travis. Thanks. Yeah, Have a good afternoon.